My job today is to talk a little bit about how the people at Opening Minds and the Anti-Stigma Initiative have been working to build better practices in stigma reduction. And while they have four target groups, I want to focus my few minutes here with you today on youth, but I'm happy to take questions about any of the other target groups during the question period, and those are healthcare providers, the media, and workplaces. If we could go to slide number seven, please. Second slide of my deck. So I thought what we'd do for starters would be to get a quick tour of terms so that we're all on the same page. Uh, many of these terms you've heard before, and they're used in different ways by different disciplines, and over time they have changed. So I just wanted to cover some of these bases with you so you'll know how I'm using the terms during my talk. So a stereotype is a misattribution. It's something that we think about a group of people and we apply it to everyone who is a member of that group, regardless of their unique characteristics. Usually they're labels, and you can see some examples of labels on this slide uh, that was uh, done by Donna the door. She has, uh, this is her experience of stigma, that the labels that apply to her, violent, sick, drain on society, untrustworthy, dangerous. So these are some of the misattributions or the stereotypes that are applied to people who have a mental illness. Prejudice, then, is a negative attitude that is resistant to change, and it's very deeply emotional. By definition, prejudices don't change with new information. People who are prejudiced avoid information that disagrees with anything that they believe. So when we're addressing a prejudice that's related to mental illness, you have to have very potent intervention. Determination, then, is unfair treatment. It typically denies someone civic, social, or human rights. And it's typically a result of prejudicial attitudes. So, not everyone who's prejudiced is discriminatory. And I'll use the term stigma to refer to a complex social process, um, not simply to refer to it as a synonym for prejudice. But this is a complex social process that results in structural inequities, discrimination, social mar marginalization, and it's really based in a power imbalance between people who are stigmatized and those who are the stigmatizers. It's a form of social oppression. And that's an uh, understanding of stigma that has come into the fore in the last few years as international legislation has, uh, has been uh, uh, brought to the foreground. I'll go to the next slide, number eight in your desk. and it's taking a bit of time. There we go. So we're starting to realize in public health that uh, stigma is a target worthy of fighting. The World Health Organization has recognized it as a hidden burden uh, related to mental illnesses, and people who have a mental illness will often describe it as more disabling and long-lasting than the illness themselves. So internationally, nationally, and locally, we are recognizing that stigma is a target worthy of fighting. And now a number of initiatives have been launched at international, national, and local level. In fact, it's, there's so many of them, it's hard not to uh, swing a cat and hit an anti-stigma initiative these days. Um, so they're gaining in presence and popularity. But what we've noticed is that many of them are not evidence-based. And in fact, they're not even evidence-informed. But typically, they're based on strongly held beliefs of the people and the advocates that are providing these programs that they work. And that would be okay, except that we do know from the research that we can do some harm if we don't do things right. So we do want to create an evidence base for anti-stigma programming. I'll go to the next slide, please, Josh. This is slide number nine in your desk for those of you on the telephone. And I wanted to put this slide in here to show you why we need to think about evidence in a very critical way and why so much of our activities need to be directed at creating evidence. Um, these are examples of a number of articles you'll find if you do a search of the applied medical journals and you put stigma in the title. And what you can see is that prior to 2000, there were virtually none. They've been increasing in numbers, but really there are not very many yet. There's only about 200 or so in any given year that are published. Um, this is not the theoretical literature. There's lots of theory, but there's very little on how to do the practice of anti-stigma. 
And so these articles that we have are less than 2% of all mental health-related articles and just an a, a infinitesimal fraction of all of the articles that appear in medical journals in any given year. Next slide, please, Paul. So I want to talk a little bit about the Opening Minds Anti-Stigma Initiative and tell you about the approach that we take. And that will be a perfect segue into Bob's presentation because he's going to give you an example of how one of these programs works. So the Opening Minds program was officially launched in 2009. And they launched it in a very flashy way by lighting the plane atop the Calgary Tower. And they did this to symbolize that they were taking mental illnesses out of the shadows. It was dark and lots of people noticed it, including some who phoned the fire department because they thought the tower was on fire. But it did get people's attention. Um, the three goals that Opening Minds has identified for itself is that the first one is to change the view of Canadians so that they treat people with mental illness as full citizens. You'll notice that this is really a behavioral goal. We want to change the way people behave. Um, at an organizational level, we want to encourage organizations to eliminate discrimination through policy change, through enactment of appropriate legislation, procedures. And finally, we want to ensure that individuals who live with a mental illness experience equal opportunities in society and in life, and in fact, that they're socially accepted and welcomed into our civic society. Next slide, please. So we have a six-step process that we use. We work with existing programs, and we try to create networks of practice. We're not about creating programs and pushing them out. We don't do service delivery in that respect. Because we need to know if things work, we're systematically evaluating outcomes across our network partners, and we're doing this using standard methods and metrics that everybody agrees are useful. Um, we're comparing results across the programs, and this allows us to identify what we're calling the best in breed or the best in class. So we can learn from each other. We can see how some programs are doing better than others, even though they seem to be doing similar things. And then what we do is try to uncover why that's happening. So we're uncovering the active ingredients in each program, asking ourselves, why is this working? It doesn't work. And once we have a, a clear understanding of this, we're in a position to build toolkits and supporting materials that can be widely distributed as part of the national strategy. And then our knowledge exchange kicks in. Once we have the toolkits, we want people to know that they're available. We want them to advocate to have these kinds of programs in their local communities. Um, we want to engage in webinars, uh, conference calls, activities like today, workshops. We want to talk uh, both to the general public, to the policymakers, as well as to the academics, because we know that academic publications are the stuff of evidence-based policy. Next slide, please, Scott. This is to give you an idea of uh, our youth practice network. We have identified about 20 programs from across Canada, and we're working together in a network. We're all doing common things. The thing that draws us all together is the fact that we're all trying to use some form of contact-based education. And by that, what I mean is that people who have experienced a mental illness are the ones that provide the education. And they do this in various ways. Often they go into classrooms in high schools or elementary schools. But sometimes they participate in creating videos, and those videos are used. Uh, we like it when there's opportunities for active discussion and active education. And uh, what this network is helping us learn is how things play out in different cultural areas. You see we have uh, one program in the north. Um, we have uh, learned a lot from trying to roll these out in different places and also looking to see how things are working and, and where they're working and where they're not. Uh, next slide, please. So I guess one of the questions people often ask us, I may be preaching to the converted today, though, is why target youth? And we know that most disorders begin in adolescence or early adulthood, and that stigma reduces the chances of early intervention and, therefore, recovery. And it does this in any number of ways. We also know that stigma is a factor in schoolyard bullying, so we want to focus on that. We find that students are highly accessible in schools, and so school-based programs are uh, an effective way of getting to students. And when they're successful, 
changing their attitudes and hopefully, hopefully their behavior. And what you're seeing here is a graph that we prepared from Statistics Canada data. They've done a rapid response survey that was funded by the Mental Health Commission. We worked with them to develop a new measure of stigma, which asked people whether or not they've been affected by others' negative opinions or whether they've been treated unfairly because of a current or past mental illness. And here are the proportion of people that answered on a scale of zero, where zero meant no, they hadn't been treated unfairly, to 10, indicating that it had extremely affected their life. This is showing you everybody who had at least some impact. And what you can see here is that the proportion of people under 25 years, only 55% of them indicated that they had been impacted by stigma in some way. And you can see that that declines over time with age. And this may be because stigma is a feature of early illness, early onset, and over time people learn how to manage it. Uh, we don't know the answer to this question, but what we do know from this graph is it's an important target group for us to aim our anti-stigma program at. Next slide. So what kinds of programs are we thinking that we should deliver? As I mentioned, there's not a lot of evidence to support uh, what we're doing yet, but we're starting to learn, and we're finding that the kinds of programs that seem to work best are programs that are positive and promote recovery messages. One of the stereotypes that the public often holds is that people who have a mental illness don't recover, and we want to challenge that, and we want to do that by modeling people who have had a personal experience with a mental illness and are managing and recovering very well. We want to include opportunities for engagement, active and experiential learning. So we find that videos work pretty well, but it really is a lot better if we have an opportunity to have direct contact with somebody who's been trained as a speaker. Uh, we want to provide opportunities for social contact. Direct contact is when someone who's had a mental illness goes into the classroom and interacts with people. Video-based contact occurs when people tell the recovery stories on a video and that video is played and it can be incorporated with uh, learning, uh, teacher-based learning, traditional learning, role plays. We've got a, num a number of opportunities to look at storybooks to focus on characters who are successfully managing a mental illness. Some of these are real characters, others are fictional. And theater productions as well uh, that allow us to uh, tell recovery stories. And I'll go to the next slide. And here's an example of why these networks are so important to us. We've been measuring two things. One of the things we're measuring are the stereotypes, and I defined those for you at the beginning. And we have 11 items that focus on various types of stereotypes, the extent to which people can control their illness. We also focus on social tolerance. So this is how tolerant and accepting people might be of someone who has a mental illness in various hypothetical situations, like in classrooms, uh, would you help someone with homework, those kinds of things. And what you can see here are four different programs, all of which have used the same measure, all of which who are using contact-based intervention delivered in classrooms. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation in the extent to which they're achieving our threshold of success, which is 80% correct answer. And one program particularly sticks out. And so this program is one we want to learn from to find out what they're doing and why are they doing it so well. But at the same time, we want to learn from programs who aren't working out as well to find out what we shouldn't be doing. So this is the strength of one of these uh, practice networks when we are using all of the same measures. Next slide, please. This is slide 16 in your deck for anybody who's following. And as I said, we want to find out which format works best. So here's one very simple example of how we can get to the bottom of this. So this is the score on the stereotype scale that we're using. And what you can see here are programs who have offered direct contact with somebody in a personal situation in a classroom. We see a program that offered a video contact. And we see a program or programs that have offered both direct and video contact together. And what you can see here is that they got higher than average uh, improvement. And so that tells us that multimodal programs may be better 
than using a single mode, but multimodal in the sense that we want to build on various types of contacts. Okay. Next slide, please. So the work that we've completed today is we've collected data from all of our partner programs, and this is amounting to a very large data set that we now have uh, the ability to work with. We have information on over 10,000 students. Uh, we have pre-test and post-test data, so we have information on what they were thinking in, uh, before the intervention, what happens after the intervention, and as you saw from our network, these are programs that span the entire country. We've analyzed and recorded about 70% of the programs, uh, the completed individual programs report, and, and as I say, we're starting to see all this variation and starting to understand what's going on. We've completed in-depth qualitative investigations with the program, and we've been busy identifying active, active ingredients in the process, and we now have just completed a very large and complex logic model that describes all of the different components that need to be into one of these programs if you're going to maximize your chances of success. And in essence, it's a roadmap for a best practice. Next slide, please. This will be my last one. So our next step is to validate these active ingredients. We need to do a little bit more quantitative analysis with those. Create the toolkits that I mentioned to you and provide the supporting materials and then start disseminating these as widely as possible. And here's where we think that social marketing approaches are going to be very helpful to us because at that point we're going to have something very concrete, a product that we can sell to people, and we think this is where social marketing works best, not when they're trying to change people's prejudices and discrimination. And I'll stop there and turn it over to my host. And